Hello to all of you and welcome back to the Smoke on Go Virtual Flight School. Last year we presented a series of lectures that were aimed at helping the private pilot, those that had started off with zero hours and were moving towards obtaining the private pilot's license at around about 40 to 50 hours. This year we focus on talking about uh, some vital information that should be conveyed to the pilot in respect of the ordinary flying that, uh, that occurs between 40 hours and 200 hours. That is the time that one has obtained a private pilot's license and is working towards uh, obtaining the commercial pilot's license. So before I go any further, a very, very special thank you to our sponsors. We have uh, Bose Aviation, we have Pratt & Whitney Canada, and we have Avcon Jet. You're flying in a beautiful aircraft where the sound is pristine. When you can still communicate without fidgeting, without adjusting, and still be able to do so effortlessly and flawlessly, you've got a winner. And that's one thing that I really love about Bose. They're always finding a way to get better, to revolutionize. I feel like I have the tool that I need to make that flight easier in some way. It's just something about having the confidence in the product that resonates with me when I have that headset with me. And I feel just proud to be able to combine both of these brands that I've always wanted to be a part of and then come together with the both of them with this life-changing experience. And that's just the truth. We're aiming at providing information for the pilot that is between 40 hours, having just obtained the private pilot's license, right up until 200 hours when they're eligible to uh, have a go at obtaining the commercial pilot's license. So uh, the subject matter involves, uh, first and foremost, the uh, night flying rating. That is what we're going to cover today. And then as we continue, we will be talking about long distance navigation. Uh, then uh, that will lead into single pilot crew resource management and risk management. And from there, we go to abnormal operations where we're going to be talking about uh, operating in bad weather where the, the resources are very, very scarce, ending off with uh, takeoff and climbing performance. If at the end of those five lectures there is an appetite for wanting to know a little bit about formation flying, then we will also present a lecture on the way that formation flying should be conducted. So as I said, we're going to start off with the night flying rating. Now, the important thing about any night flying is the realization that night flying involves instrument flying. I am not talking about an instrument rating, I'm talking about instrument flying. With instrument flying, we're looking at the many ways in which an aeroplane can be and should be maneuvered with sole reference to the flight instruments. Unlike the instrument rating, there you have to 
of course be able to fly the aeroplane, but what is brought into the instrument rating uh, are the procedures associated with all sorts of letdowns, VOR letdowns, ILS letdowns, RNAV, GNSS letdowns, etc., etc., and also the departures that are associated with uh, uh, instrument flying. All that we are going into here today is instrument flying per se. Right. So what happens is that we look at being able to uh, uh, control the aeroplane in all three planes of movement. And what we focus on essentially is straight and level flight, turning, descending, climbing, climbing turns, descending turns. And once you can achieve all of those and you have mastery over the aeroplane in that respect, you are then able to continue with the night flying, but not until you are able to fly the aeroplane on instruments. Now, I want to go back some 56 years or so uh, to the mid-1960s when I myself was a pupil pilot learning to fly on Harvard's. And you can see that the Harvard's cockpit is well fenestrated. In other words, it, there are a lot of uh, window panes over here. When we were taught to fly on instruments, the instructor sat in the front of the aeroplane. The rest of the time, he'd always sat in the back teaching a, a pupil pilot. But the instructor sat in the front of the aeroplane over here, and the student, the person that was learning to fly on instruments, was put into the back cockpit, and there was a canvas hood that came from the back of the cockpit right over the top of the, uh, the student's head, and it was attached to the instrument panel in the front over here, and all that the pupil pilot could see was the instruments. Not a single thing outside of the aeroplane was visible, and that's how you were taught to fly on instruments. In the civilian world, obviously, you can't do that with, uh, with the, the, the aeroplanes that are used for flying training. So they use an instrument flying hood. That's the best that can be done. But nevertheless, it does blank out everything else so that all that is visible or that should be visible is the instrument panel and a lot of the controls associated with the flying of the aeroplane and the management of the engine. And so we uh, go through all of those maneuvers, what I have just mentioned. Uh, on learning to fly on Harvard's, it went a lot further than that. We were also taught to fly on limited panel, and every single thing that you are able to do with a full complement of instruments, you are expected to do with limited instruments. In other words, without an artificial horizon and without a directional indicator. It went further than that. We were expected to be able to do a steep turn on limited panel, and believe it or not, after learning how to stall the aeroplane on instruments, we had to accomplish um, the entry into a spin, the maintenance of the spin, and then the recovery from the spin, all on limited panel instruments. Right. The next thing that they paid a lot of attention to was the recovery from awkward attitudes. And this is done in the civilian world as well. What are unusual attitudes? Well, you can either have a nose high situation with bank, increasing or decreasing, but usually increasing, and the speed low. That was the attitude that you had to be able to recover from. Nose high, bank on, speed reducing, or nose low, bank applied, and the speed increasing. You had to bring that aeroplane back and recover to a gentle climb. So 
You need to be taught all of this, or most of it. In the civilian world, forget about the spinning. You don't even do the spinning VFR, looking outside of the cockpit. But uh, you are expected, certainly, to be able to handle this aeroplane absolutely, perfectly, and accurately on instruments. Right. So, a couple of other things about instrument flying, night flying. When you fly at night, it is very important to preserve your night vision. You always operate uh, in, in an environment where there is subdued light. The moment you are subjected to a very, very bright light, and you go back onto the instruments, there is temporary blindness. It makes it very difficult to, uh, to be able to read the instruments if you have been exposed to bright light. And when you do aviation medicine about the rods and the cones, those are uh, photoreceptors that have to do with the intensity of light. You talk about rods and cones, the one is for white light, the other one is for red light. So what we do is we operate wherever we can with a, a subdued light inside of the cockpit. The instruments are are, are light it up nicely but with with special lighting so that your night vision is not affected when it comes to the use of a lighting at night we have landing lights and they are there for the purpose of, uh, of seeing where you're going on the takeoff, seeing where you're going on the landing, judging your height above the ground, etc. The landing lights, they are navigation lights. The navigation lights make the aeroplane visible throughout a 360 degree circle. So on the left wing, there will be a red light, and that should be visible within an arc that begins there, say, and ends up there. On the right-hand wing, you will have a, a, a green light, and that will be visible from throughout an arc from there to there, and then on the tail, right here at the back of the fin, they will have a white line that sh shines backwards, and that will be visible through an arc that extends from there to there. All in all, through 360 degrees, there is this area where the aeroplane can be seen by other aeroplanes in flight. For those of you that uh, listened in last year, you will remember how I stressed the importance of looking after your hearing. So joining us tonight is uh, Bose to talk to us on that subject. Hi, my name is Theodora Sik and I am working for Bose Aviation. I am a relationship manager for the Europe, Middle East, and African region. We are a proud sponsor of this virtual flight safety school presented to you by Scully Levin. With our product, pilots can fly safely with confidence and enjoy their flight. We too, as a headset manufacturer, value the safety of our pilots. And that's why our products are TSO certified, which ensures a minimum performance standard for a specified material parts and appliances used on civil aircraft. We have a range of two products, the Bose 20 aviation headset and the ProFly Series 2 aviation headset. The A20 has a round ear configuration for a higher noise environment like those found in turboprop and piston engine aircraft. The ProFly Series 2 aviation headset has an in-ear configuration and it is engineered for pilots operating in moderately noisy environments, such as pressurized turbine aircraft. This is a wonderful opportunity to be able to connect with you via this interactive class and sponsoring this event. We hope you'll learn a lot through Scully's valuable experience and that you will very soon apply all those learnings. We talk about 
runway or airport lighting systems. This is a very, very important part of your training to know what is available or what you might have or not have in terms of lighting. So I'm going to start with the most impressive lighting system I personally ever came across in my life as an airline pilot. And that was uh, when I operated in and out of Heathrow Airport in London. There was simply no other airport that I came across in the world that had such a wonderful lighting system. So let's take you through this bit by bit. You would start up in a parking bay and you would leave the parking area at the airport and uh, you would taxi down a taxiway and there would be a green light that you followed. Your taxi route from the time that you left the parking bay until you eventually got to the runway for the takeoff was predetermined by the air traffic controllers. It was put into a computerized system and the lighting across the, the, the entire airport was actually activated so that all you had to do was follow a green light on the taxiway. As you left the dispersal area and you were on the taxiway alone, you had blue lights. This was the convention. I am saying that Heathrow had everything. Not all airports have got everything. Some have got nothing. Nothing. You can barely see where you're going when you're taxiing. But basically the convention is to have the green light down the taxiway and blue lights marking the extreme left and the extreme right of that taxiway. Along the way, if there were taxiways that cut across, there would be taxiway stoplights where red lights would pop up and stop you from taxiing any further and blow me down. Once you brought the aeroplane to a stop, you would see an aeroplane taxi past you from right to left or left to right. Once those aeroplanes had passed through, the red stop bar lights moved away, the green light came back, and you followed the green light towards the runway beginning. When you got to the runway beginning, during the run up, there the red light was. You had to stop. When you'd accomplished your pre takeoff checks, your vital actions, you'd called for permission to take off, you'd been granted that. The red light went away, the green light led you onto the runway. Once you were on the runway, what would you see over there? You would see slap bang down the center of the runway, what we call the runway center line lights. What was the color? The color was white. Either side of you on the left extremity of the runway and on the right you had the RELs, the runway edge lights. Those lights are white as well. So you've got three rows of lights. You've got the runway center line lights, you've got the runway edge lights, either side of you. You commence the takeoff roll and you run towards the end of the runway. Depending on how heavy you are, you might use most of the runway. What do you actually see approaching the end of the runway? First of all, the runway center lights start having lights that alternate in color. They go from plain white to white and red for a distance and then eventually red as you come up towards the end of the runway. At the end of the runway there is the runway stop light. You can go no further. You've got to be in the air by then. Okay. On the left and on the right you had the white runway edge lights and uh, as you got closer towards the end of the runway with about 900 meters or so to go, the light started alternating. White and amber, and the amber turns to red as you get towards the end of the runway. So by looking at all of those lights and understanding what they were doing over there, 
it enhanced the safety, it enhanced the situational awareness. You knew where you had to be, you knew what you would be able to see. And please, I'm not saying that Heathrow's the only airport. There are some fantastic other airports all over the world. I am just saying that this is the one that made the greatest impression on me because of the number of times I flew to London. Coming back, what you would have is you would have a row of five white lights that were exactly in line with the runway center line lights, except that there were five beams so that you could really pick these up nicely from a long way out. They were called runway approach lights. In the last 300 meters before you got to the runway, left and right of you, you had red barrettes that marked the imminent uh, beginning of the runway to tell you, especially in bad weather operations, that you were in the right place at the right height. Then w there were green lights that marked the runway threshold. So all of those lights are able to tell you at all times exactly where you are in the overall sphere of things. Terrific for situational awareness. As the airports get smaller and as the volume of traffic that goes through that airport becomes less and less, so they dispense with certain of these lighting systems. And you have less and less to go by. So what you're going to lose are these approach lights, the approach light system. You might then lose the runway center line lighting. You might lose the elaborate multicolored lights that are associated with the impending end of the runway. Eventually you get to the situation where the type of airport that, that you as 400 to 200 hour pilots are going to be flying in and out of might not have any taxiway lighting at all. All you are going to have is perhaps uh, the runway threshold lights, the runway end lights and the runway edge lights. It gets worse than that. Next thing to go are the threshold lights and the stop lights at the end of the runway and eventually you're left with a flare path. You might not even have uh, lighting on the taxiway. Now, only the other day I gave a lesson to someone. We did some night flying training and we, we landed at Rand Airport. It was pitch dark and we had to taxi back to dispersal and what happened was that we aeroplanes uh, landing light was not functioning properly and then at all but I'll get back onto that and what happened is that one of us had to actually open up a door and take a torch and and light up the area ahead to see where we were going so you might just end up with a runway that has edge light on the one side, edge lights on the other side. That is indeed the way that I learned to fly back in the middle 60s. We never even had an electrified runway. What we had was gooseneck flares. So on the evenings that we were going to do night flying training, they had a tractor and they had a wagon behind that tractor and they loaded that up with paraffine tins that had a sort of gooseneck at the top and there was some sort of material stuck in there that sucked the paraffin up and they were lit by means of matches, and that's what you had running up the left and the right-hand side of the runways, exactly what was used during World War II, gooseneck flares. It made it very, very difficult 
to find your way to the beginning of the runway for your flight. The thing was as well that we always had to be very careful and one should always be in this day and age, no matter what you're flying, be it a Boeing 747 or something small like a Cessna 150, you have to be so careful in your use of landing lights at the pilots in sitting in other aeroplanes. You don't blind them. You don't blind the air traffic controllers by taxiing in such a manner that your lights shine straight into the control tower. And also ground personnel, people that have got a job to do on the dispersal area, driving vehicles, etc., etc. You can't blind them with those uh, landing lights. You have to be careful as to how sparingly you use those landing lights because they absorb a terrific amount of current, okay? And the other thing is that when you're taxiing, you are taxiing with RPM from the engine or engines that is very low and the generator is not replenishing the amount of electricity or, uh, that is available in the battery or batteries. So you can run your batteries flat very quickly. Also, there's usually, uh, with, with old-fashioned lights on the older aeroplanes before the uh, advent of LEDs, uh, there was the tendency for these landing lights to become very, very hot and then for the filaments to fuse. So uh, the landing lights during taxi should be used sparingly. What we haven't talked about is the use of strobe lights. Now, strobe lights can also be very, very damaging. When you are taxiing in the vicinity of where other aeroplanes are. If you switch on your strobe lights, it might cause a tremendous amount of discomfort for those that are around you. So you have to be careful about strobe light usage in the vicinity of other aeroplanes. Now, I often think of the night show that we do with the Flying Lions Harvards. They've got the antiquated landing lights. The other thing is that the generators only start charging from about 12, 1300 RPM onward. So you can run your batteries flat very, very quickly. Okay. And the other thing is that we have the strobe lights. We cannot put the strobe lights on when we taxiing out because of the discomfort that they cause. We cannot use those strobe lights when the four of us are flying close to each other after the sun is set or in fact when it is pitch dark. So what are those strobe lights doing there? And I'll tell you, once we have finished the, with our show and the, we have flown the grand finale for the air show and we've split up as four separate aeroplanes, it becomes very difficult to find out where the other aeroplanes are so that we can actually get together again. And that is when we brief particularly to switch on strobe lights so that we can see where the guys are. We split by five, six hundred meters each and by so doing bring the formation back together for the, the, the final run in and the break and the spread for the landing. That's what we use our strobe lights for. So we've talked enough about lighting and the layout of airfields, etc., etc. 
within the flying club or the Plotterland flying school community, in the event that you are going to be doing any night flying out there, like like when I was a roving instructor working in a northern Natal, we did night flying in places like Newcastle and uh, uh, Amersfoort, Volksrust, Dundee in the Cape, and even in Pongola. That's where we did our night flying, and we did it with very, very crude and primitive gooseneck flares and nothing else. So I'm talking about being so very, very aware about where you are going to taxi at night and how you are going to use those lights. Right, so we now come back to the actual night flying. We know how to preserve our night vision. We know how to use our lighting. We know about lighting systems, and we know that night flying involves instrument flying. So very, very important. But depending on where your airfield is located, you might have so much ambient lighting around you. The airport might be in an urban area. Rand is one such airport. Benoni Brackpan, Springs, Lanseria, uh, to an extent. I'll get to that in a moment. At Grand Central, wherever you look, there is urban sprawl. There's one suburb after another and they are all lit up and you belt down the runway, you get airborne and there's the, you've got a very definite horizon and you say, what is the big deal? All right, the lighting that is available and that exists almost makes a mockery of instrument flying and night flying because it's so very much like daytime flying. There the horizons are, 360 degrees, wherever you look, the place is lit up too beautifully. The only challenge that really, really exists is to find the runway or to find the airport. If you go for a flight out over the Greater Johannesburg metropolitan area, you do a flight from uh, Rand Airport to, say, Krugersdorp, and you mess around over there, and you come back and you've got to start looking for Rand Airport, it is going to be a struggle. That is the only ch real challenge that faces you, is finding that airport. Rand at least has a flashing beacon that you look for, and that will show you where the airport is. But if that if flashing beacon is not working, you can really tear your hair out looking for where the airport is and getting yourself orientated. Because the lights that exist there on runway 29 and uh, 11, they're not nearly as bright as the, the, the lights that you see on the highways, the main roads through the center of Johannesburg. So that becomes a big challenge, finding the airport. But as for the rest of it, so simple to do your night flying over a metropolitan area. Things become very, very difficult when you're out there in the Plotterland. And even so, there has been so much urban sprawl, there's also been electrification across the country, and wherever you look, there are far more lights than existed 50 years ago. There was no electrification. There were, there were just the odd sporadic lights that you saw from small towns. The rest of the time, it was pitch dark. Here and there, you had farmers. They had their own uh, uh, electrical generating systems, and you could see the lights of farmhouses. Perhaps uh, you never saw much traffic on the roads, no lighting from that. It could be really, really dark. So dark, in fact, at night flying, 
became almost like instrument flying. That's why you had to learn how to fly instruments, because there you were out over eastern Gauteng and Mpumalanga, over the farmland over there, and there were just the odd little towns with their white light. The rest of it, it was pitch dark. If there was no moon, you were in for a little bit of a rough ride. You spent a lot of time on your instruments. Okay, so now... What I'm telling you is so very, very important. Where there is no other lighting and all you have is your instruments, that is how you have to fly the aeroplane. You can't expect to look outside and remain flying on an even keel. Uh, it's like flying in cloud. That's how difficult it can become. So I think back over the years, I certainly am not aware of all the night flying accidents that have occurred in this country. But I do remember very, very vividly, there was a case where uh, an airplane took off in pitch darkness, no moonlight, out of Durban, Virginia, going up the coast, up the coast. That would have been uh, in, in a northeasterly direction where the sea was out on the right-hand side over here and on the left uh, you had uh, various suburbs like Durban North and you had Mshlonga Rocks. But out over the sea it was actually pitch, 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 pitch dark. And what happened there was the, the pilot got airborne, high-performance aeroplane, climbed out steeply, commenced a turn over the sea without any horizon, immediately became disorientated, never stuck to the instruments, and the aeroplane went into a not even a half a turn of a spiral dive, boom, and into the water. Barely airborne for a minute or two before the pilot lost control, went into the sea, and uh, there was a, a loss of life, two or three people. Right. The same happened in the Free State. There was a guy that went to visit friends on a farm, maybe even family, and they had a lovely strip in between the millies, but need I tell you how uh, once the sun had gone down, the sun had set, and there was no more twilight, it became very, very dark. There were no lights in the vicinity. That pilot took off in the turn, the reversal to come back to Johannesburg. He lost uh, situational awareness. He lost uh, uh, control of the aeroplane, it went into a spiral dive, and once again there was a fatal accident. That's two that I know of. The third and final one that I know about was the one that happened out of uh, Sun City, and that was before that area became electrified. There were, there were the mountains on the side of the runway, Behind the aeroplane were the lights of uh, Rustenburg. The aeroplane was taking off towards the north into what they call a black hole. There was absolutely no lighting. First turn that was being made to go back to wherever the aeroplane had come from. The pilot lost control, disorientated, vertigo, boom, into the ground. One, two, three fatalities. Right. Don't think it just happens with small aeroplanes because with airline operations, there are so very many airports that are located right on a coastline, right on a coastline and out towards sea. Of course, if there aren't any ships in the harbor or moored offshore, it can be 
incredibly dark. You cannot even see a horizon. You can't see where the sea gives way to the sky and vice versa. I think, for example, of Mauritius. Mauritius is a small island. When you're going out towards the east, as you rotate the aeroplane, you are immediately out over the sea. There is nothing there in front of you until you get to Australia. And you're doing this in, in pitch darkness. And uh, in the event that a turn is involved, straight off to take off with nothing. All right, maybe not even stars if you have a, uh, a, 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 an overcast. You're not going to see any stars either, although they can be disorientating, as I will tell you in a moment. So what happens over there is you have to be very careful of what they call these black hole takeoffs. That brings me to the worst case of an accident in this respect that I know of. And what I need to tell you about is about the protocols involved in engaging an autopilot and the way that airline pilots operate. In any airliner, you will have the commander, the captain, sitting left-hand seat. You will have the co-pilot, first officer, sitting right-hand seat. Most airlines, they fly leg for leg. So... If you're going from here to Durban and then coming back 10 to 1, it's the captain that's going to fly the first leg. All right, he is the pilot flying, PF. And the other pilot is the pilot monitoring. Not only does he uh, handle uh, the requests that a captain might make uh, or any selections that a captain wants made, he will ask the co-pilot for those, but the co-pilot will also be the pilot monitoring. And he will ensure that no parameters are uh, exceeded, that there's not too much bank, there's not too much pitch, that the speed is uh, in the right band, that the, the flaps are uh, retracted or extended at the correct speeds, etc., etc. A pilot flying and a pilot monitoring. Those roles change. The seats don't change, but the role changes for the return flight, where the first officer will now be the pilot flying and the captain will be the pilot monitoring. Does this apply to the airlines only? No, it doesn't. It applies in the executive world. And for those of you listening tonight, once you've got your commercial uh, pilot licenses and an instrument rating and perhaps an instructor's rating, eventually you'll move on to bigger aeroplanes and you might make a career of uh, flying executive aeroplane. Well, the same principles apply. Two-man operation, pilot flying, pilot monitoring, and you alternate leg for leg. And you have these duties, these protocols. There are two pilots. Most aeroplanes have two autopilots. Some have three. But let's have a look at the, the vast majority of these advanced aeroplanes, the top of the range exec aeroplanes and the medium range and medium sized airliners. They have two autopilots. You can call them autopilot A and autopilot B, or you can call them autopilot one and autopilot two. The thing is that all takeoffs are done manually. Once the aeroplane is climbing away from the ground, it is common practice to engage an autopilot very early in the departure of the aeroplane. As it is climbing through 400 foot, in most airlines, there is a call for an autopilot to be engaged. Because the autopilot in a navigational mode is going to fly a noise abatement departure far more accurately than the human hand is ever going to be able to. And therefore, you won't get noise exceedances. And also, uh, if the departure is pre-programmed and it's taking you through mountainous 
terrain like uh, Rio de Janeiro, like, like the old uh, uh, Hong Kong airport, etc., etc. Then if, if the autopilot was engaged, there was less chance of human fallibility, less chance of a mistake. The autopilot would do a good job. But the thing is that in order to engage the autopilot, there must be no aileron input whatsoever. So if you're asking for an autopilot to be engaged when you are already in a turn, then that control column, that stick, should have been returned to the neutral position. But that's the way we fly, not so. Not so. We apply bank, we check it, and then we release the, the, the stick or the control column. If there is any aileron input one way or the other, that autopilot cannot be engaged until the stick or the control column is back in the neutral position. So what happened was there was a, a departure out of uh, an airfield on the African coast up near the equator, right there on the coastline, the airplane was taking off and turning out and there was a black hole out there. In other words, the horizon could not be seen. There were no lights on the ground, nothing. Okay, the airplane was in the turn. The captain called for his autopilot, that would be autopilot A or autopilot number one to be engaged, but there was still an aileron input. So the first officer made the selection, pressed the button, but the autopilot did not engage. And there was no proper monitoring function that was being applied. So the co-pilot never said, Autopilot selected, autopilot engaged. There was no confirmation of the engagement thereof. So what happened was that the captain, assuming that the autopilot had actually engaged, neglected to monitor the instruments for a brief couple of seconds, and the first officer never applied the pilot monitoring philosophy and what happened was that the airplane's bank angle just increased the airplane went into a spiral dive and it went into a dark swamp an open area of swampland not even 15 miles away from the airport or from the center of the city not too sure about where but no one ever expected the airplane to have been lost so soon after takeoff so it's serious stuff here we're talking about, and that is the instrument flying aspect involved in flying at night. So I'm going to end off with one more story over here. Not really a story. I was there. I was a flying instructor at the time at Central Flying School, and our training curriculum called for an, a solo night navigational flight. So you'd been taught your instrument flying, first of all. There should have been no doubt as to the ability of the pilot that eventually lost his life to fly the aeroplane on instruments. All of the aforementioned things that I talked about, right down to the recovery from awkward attitudes and spinning, had been covered satisfactorily. That particular pilot had in fact done his night dual cross-country flight. The flights that we used to do took us out over the eastern part of uh, Gauteng and uh, to Mpumalanga, to the towns Brayton, Carolina, perhaps Ermelo, which looked like a city in those days. Uh, that it was uh, so much bigger than the smaller towns. Amersfoort and Morgenson, small hamlets and a very, very little lighting. 
And because the navigation flights would, would, would be dispatched at 10-minute uh, intervals, there was always a noise over these towns, and people would sit outside on their verandas and watch the sight of, the, of perhaps 20 aeroplanes on an evening at 10-minute intervals coming over their little town and sitting heading for the next town. And I told you that there was very, very little additional lighting, nothing else. Maybe a couple of farm lights here and there, but it could be very dark when there was very, very little uh, lighting from the moon. But what happened was that overhead one of these towns, and I do believe it was Brayton, which is also near a little place called Botplas. Can you see that there is a lot of slope on this canopy over here, the plexiglass. You've got huge panes of glass that line either side. And uh, there was often a reflection. When you passed over one of these towns, the lighting reflected off the side of the panels. And you would turn and head for the next town, and in the middle of one such turns, the pilot, as he was turning, was disorientated by the lighting that was reflecting off either one side or both sides of the panels, but enough to cause a vertigo and an uncertainty, and the aeroplane went into a spiral dive. And unfortunately, we're all human, even though you are trained for these eventualities, nothing prepares you for the shock. And, and, and the uncertainty sometimes when you ask yourself, how, how did I end up over here? Where am I going? What am I doing? And there's a panic factor as well. And, and this was actually seen. The whole event was seen by, by eyewitnesses in the town because, as I said, that was the only entertainment that they would have for months on end. And then also there was this the plaintive cry all right, and almost a, like a, a hysterical cry over the over the radio as the pilot uh, sent out a, a, a message in, in absolute futility. Who was going to help him or how? Terrible sound to hear, the sound of a person in panic and uncertainty, etc. And uh, that aeroplane spiral dived right into the ground. The world depends on aerospace. And aerospace depends on us to engineer the propulsion flight demands, to lift and connect us to new possibilities, and to bring us home. To be ready to powerfully defend our values. help keep us safe, to enable us to prosper and thrive, and enjoy more amazing days, to build and grow relationships, for help in urgent moments, and hope wherever it's needed most. Aerospace depends on us for powerful, sustainable propulsion. Reliably there, everywhere, lifting us into the future and up toward the stars. We are Pratt & Whitney, powering aviation. Depend on it.